special guest tonight. Originally, I was going to do a show um, dealing with the difference between captivity and uh, colonization and dealing with the Harambe guerrilla situation. I uh, was also going to deal with, to some degree, with um, Muhammad Ali and have a whole bunch of brothers call in. But I, I, acting on my recent activity, I think it was right to do this show because I recently attend, attended a um, what's called Black Wall Street Expo. And during this expo, I met my good brother, who I've been a part of his group for a while, but never met him in person, my brother Chris Johnson. And in the process of the Black Wall Street Expo, which was basically a gathering together of men and women in the capital district of African descent that are business owners and the promotion of entrepreneurship, um, in this particular event, you had workshops. And the first workshop that was up was Afronomics. Now, I've been a part of the Brothers Afronomics group for a while, but I didn't really know much about the organ, um, about the philosophy and the principles. And uh, I was blown away by the workshop. It was very, very good. And I did buy the uh, poster that he has that espouses the concepts. You know, brothers and sisters, um, we, you know, we in the black nationalist community, my, uh, my dealing with BAIO, other than the fact that these are some brothers and sisters whom I love, um, share the same vision with, my dealing with BAIO, my part in it, my niche in it, is I continue to ask the question, because when you ask the question, what is the end game? I continue to ask a micro question within that question being this. If the time came to go, would you be ready? If you had independent territory in America, what role would you play in it? If you had a independent territory off the shores of America, out of the uh, jurisdiction of your slave master or former slave master and enemy, out of the clutches of those whom you would call your enemy. If you had a separate territory, what would your role be in that territory? What would your role be in that city, that government, that nation state? And I think that a lot of people do not really have the answer to that question. I think a lot of people um, romanticize as to what would happen if black people had our own nation state, but really haven't done the preparation to be a part of the nation state. And so therefore, we really are fixing to have a lot of dead weight in a uh, proposed utopia, and that would be far from utopia because it would kind of be chaos. So where does Brother Chris come in as far as I'm concerned? I think Brother Chris lends himself to the situation here in America and the situation abroad because Brother Chris is a, um, a, fi uh, a financial expert as well as advisor, and he has a lot of principles that deal with personal self-development, with uh, self-growth. And really, I'll I just I'll sum it up like this, brothers and sisters, before I bring him in. My dad told me a long time ago, and he keeps me in at home. He says, son, he says, the reality of it is, is that a person can tell your level of maturity by how you handle your money. I'm going to say that again. A person can tell your level of maturity by how you handle your money. So in other words, you cannot act as though you are mature. You cannot act as though you're grown up. We uh, like to use the terminology boss and things like that. But really, are we a boss? Are we grown up? Are we grown as man or woman if we do not have a good control or a good handle on our finances? And to me, I really think the answer is definitely not. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, be that as it may and it is. I think that you and I as a people, we need to be able to admit that we need help with this because nobody's trying to shame you. Well, I won't say nobody, but BAIO, we're not trying to shame you. We love black people. We want to see black people free. We want to see black people with an advantage and, and to work a little bit less hard than everybody else to get to where – excuse me, not than everybody else because we work as – I, I would say as a people, we work harder than anybody else to put together finance and economics, but we would like to see it go easier for you, and we would like to see you have more support. And this is why you know, there's a lot of people out there that's talking about black economics and cooperative economics, but my brother here, he gives you a practical step-by-step -step way in which to get to that. So I would say with no further, um, with no further delay, I will bring in my good brother and let us hear from him. Caller from the three six zero. Is that you, brother Chris? Yes, ma'am. Oh, 
Can fantastic. you hear me, Minister? Yes, sir. I can hear you, brother. How you doing? Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a little fantastic. Ring- yeah, it's a little ringy out here, so I just want to make sure the reception's good. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's rainy. It's rainy here, too. Are you outside of you? No, no, I'm no, I'm inside. I'm just looking out the window. Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah. I okay. think um, kind of my internet connection was messed up this morning because of that, but everything seems to be well. How you doing today, brother? I haven't I haven't spoken to you since I saw you yesterday. How you doing? Yeah, I was doing pretty good. Actually, I was uh, spending the day recovering. Um, actually, spending part of the day reading the latest issue of the Final Call, where the minister uh, is encouraging black entrepreneurs to be bold. And uh, right. I, I also intend to purchase the DVD, which has his uh, presentation at, I think it's at Tennessee State University, where he sure. talks about business and warfare, which I, I think is a is an understatement in, in today's climate. No doubt. No doubt indeed, big brother. <laughs> no doubt. So let, let's uh, let's rewind for a couple of seconds because I have your, your principles in front of me, but I want to give people a background about who you are. Can you please tell the people who you are and how you came about the concept of Afronomics? Give them a okay. short bio. Yes. Uh, my bio is I uh, have just launched a company called Liberty Hall Press, which is what I call a self-empowerment company where we do mm-hmm. educational workshops and seminars doing in the areas of business, entrepreneurship, and self-help. Uh, the concept of Afronomics really kicked off around, I'd say, about 2007, where I began to put together – well, let me go back. I wanted to come up with an economic blueprint that anyone could follow, even at a grassroots level. I was led back into Message to the Black Man by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I dug up his economic blueprint. And in reading this, there were things that he could do that anyone who could read a stop sign could follow. Right. I I say this kind of half-jokingly. I basically took that blueprint and basically put it on steroids over a 10-year period to where it's where it is today with the 20-point program of Afronomics. The reason the reason I say it is because a lot of times our elders and our ancestors leave things for us that right. they may see things in the future that we don't. Like, for example, uh, one of the things I always quote from the messenger is that there will come a day when whites will not be able to employ themselves. And we've seen Indeed. that now in areas of globalization, downsizing, uh, privatization, and outsourcing. So – that prediction that the messenger had has come to fruition. So from an economic standpoint, I took that blueprint and I basically said, now how do I fill in the blanks of what the messenger saw so when I come before the people in this era, they can understand what the messenger was saying back in the day. Right, right, right. Hmm. Fantastic. So how did you come up with the name Afronomics? And this is a true story. Uh, I'm sitting at home, and maybe I'm kind of half asleep, but I woke up, and I'm watching a Deepak Chopra video that someone had given me. And all of a sudden, I heard this in my uh, ear, and the whisper, it just whispered gently, Afronomics. You know, it just said Afronomics. And I took that, and I gave it the name to the blueprint I was writing. And so over a 10-year period, I went back over all the years that uh, I've researched businesses that we've been involved in, as well as some of our black titans, as well as my own personal experience uh, in areas of business and finance, and basically put this whole thing together. And like I said, it took 10 years. So being able to take 10 years of, of of a hustle and grind and be able to deliver it to an audience within a one to one and a half hour period. Um, You know, so that way we would have that fighting chance or that puncher's chance to gain some level of economic prosperity. Right, right. Man, fantastic, brother. Okay, so 
Because uh, I, I, I really want to get into it, but there's so much other uh, important things I want to ask you. Other than Message to a Black Man and some things that you read from the minister, what else uh, did you read in order to come up with your, your program? Uh, I also went back into studying some of our some of those who preceded what Afronomics is. Uh, many of you are familiar with Dr. Claude Anderson and his Poweronomics uh-huh. program. Uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with Dr. Jim Klingman out of Cincinnati, uh, who wrote a book right. called Blackonomics, huh. um, who was in charge of the, I think, the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce, and he also used to teach entrepreneurship at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, there is also Dr. Juwaza Kinjufu with his work called Black Economics, and going uh-huh. back to our ancestral scholar, uh, Dr. Amos Wilson, who whose book, uh, Blueprint for Black Power, is one of my main reference books in dealing with the economic philosophy for African people in the 21st century and beyond. So those were kind of the uh, texts that served as kind of a uh, framework for putting together uh, the Afronomics principle. And the way I would describe Afronomics basically is taking – Rich Dad, Poor Dad, meeting Malcolm X's economic philosophy of black nationalism. And that's, that's really how I would sum it up if anybody really wanted to get a gist of it. So I take those two individuals together and still using the Messenger's Economic Blueprint as, as a foundation. So that's, that's really uh, how I came to Afronomics in a nutshell. Got you, got you. Fantastic, brother. And uh, I can't even state to the audience enough how powerful it is. Um, you know, you may look at the name. Even the name to me is powerful, but it, to, to to sit down and hear you present that was it was quite an experience because, you know, you speak the way I like people to speak. You're, you're very blunt. You're very to the point. You don't beat around the bush with it. You're not um, harsh and overcritical, but you get to the matter at hand and, and, and present it in such fashion that a person dealing with a situation doesn't feel like you're shaming them, but definitely knows if there's something that they're not doing is that they should now start doing it. So I guess uh, the last question I would like to ask you before we really get into this is, um, so I don't know if you got a chance to listen to any of the radio shows where you heard the opening of what I was saying. BAIO, Black African Infrastructure Organization, we are black men and women, and we stand <clears throat> for a independent uh, nation state off the shores of America on the content of our continent of our ancestors, and we also uh, what's called advocate for satellite communities in America. And our mission, uh, our way of looking at it is very simple. We believe that you should have satellite communities in America, but the host nation should be off the shores of America. We believe that you would have a better fighting chance if it was out of the jurisdiction of America and they could not influence your economics, they could not influence your logistics, your infrastructure, and things like that. We believe that you really don't have a nation or independence if you don't control your infrastructure because a lot of people are talking nation building, but one thing that they do leave out of it is infrastructure, You know, as in your power grid, your sewage, um, your information pipeline, things like that, the very bare bones and backbone, your transportation system. So we, as a black man and black woman, we uh, want to put together the best and the brightest engineers, scientists, technology, engineering, mathematics people, as well as um, skilled administrative brothers and sisters, and men and women who just want to work. And we believe that when we get enough of these people together with the plan, that we can go and we can acquire some territory on the continent. But not it's not a back to Africa movement per se, because you know that's what people try to limit us to. We want to have a – the host nation has to be off the shores of America. But for us to have satellite communities in America in which we could do trade and trade resources and build you know, things here, um, mm-hmm. it's just that where they would answer to, where we would answer to, would be off the shores of America. So I, I mm-hmm. guess I wanted to, to – before we jumped into your program, what did you think of that? Well, it's interesting. There was something that um, you had pointed out that – uh, one of my teachers, uh, uh, Brother Steve Coakley, always asks the question is, what's the bottom line? Because we have to get into a room and discuss, okay, what is the end game? Because you and I both know that not all African people 
see things the same way, and we don't see right. that in game. It's kind of like um, me having played college football. Okay, um, I had a coach who always talked about what is the objective of pass rushing when you have to rush to get to the quarterback. He said the objective is to put the quarterback down so where he can't hurt us. A lot of times we get tied up in fighting with the blocker until we forget the ultimate objective of getting to the quarterback. And I think Mm -hmm. that position with what many of us were engaged in, what's called Black Liberation Movement, we get so addicted to the struggle until we don't discuss an end game because a lot of us have not seen the uh, movement that far yet. Right. Okay, right. because what is the end game? And I think that's a very poignant question uh, in your introduction is, what is the end game for African people? And really, I build the end game down to two things. Do you want real liberation, true liberation, or do you just want better treatment on the plantation? And really, those are the only two mm-hmm. choices about what is the ultimate end game. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. I couldn't have said no better. So we did, I, I knew we would definitely be in agreement and click. All right, well, let, let's dig on into your program, brother. Let's, let's, let's do this. Okay. okay. So the okay. first uh, – Yes. I'll start oh, yeah, off sorry. with – Okay, yeah, I'll start off with a, with a quote from the messenger in Message to the Black Man in America, which I feel is the – which sets the tone for Afronomics. And this is a quote from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's Message to the Black Man. We, we oh. must begin. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we must begin at the cradle and teach our babies that they must do something for self. They must mm-hmm. not be like me, their fathers, who look to the slave masters and the slave masters' children for all. We must teach our children now with an enthusiasm exceeding that which our slave masters used in having our forefathers embed the seed of dependency within us. We must stop the process of giving our brain power, labor, and wealth to our slave master's children. We must eliminate the master-slave relationship. Right. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> okay, so your first, uh, your first three. Um, we want African people to practice the 10% solution, which is pay yourself first. We want African people to give 10% of their income revenue to race-first organizations committed to improving their lives and livelihoods of African people, cultural tithing. Number three, we want African people to save and convert 20% of their annual salary each year into a, a, a source of revenue outside of employment. Yes. Okay. Now, the, the I'll, I'll start with the first one. The late W. Clement Stone made a comment about paying yourself first. He says that this is the first step or the first skill you must master in the road to wealth building. If you cannot master this, then the seeds of greatness are not with, within you. Right. Okay. And I also say to this is that you must treat yourself with the same importance of your cable bill, your electric bill, or any other bill that you pay. I've always said this. When payday comes, okay, the bills will be there. The question is, will you be at the front or the back of the line? Right. Okay. Right. Good that's, question. That's the first one. The second one, when I talk about cultural tithing, and this is something that I've noticed within uh, those of us in the Christian community about tithing, I asked myself this question, and I think you were in the room yesterday. I use the example of anyone who's ever attended a historically black college and university. And if mm-hmm. that individual gave to her alma mater, which she does, that to me is a form of cultural tithing where I've always said charity begins at home. So if the sister mm-hmm. cuts a check to her HBCU, that's cultural tithing. Uh, if you and I were to raise X amount of dollars for Muhammad's economic blueprint, that's cultural tithing. So basically right. we're giving to organizations and movements that are geared towards the upliftment of African people. Huh. Huh. Indeed, okay. brother. Indeed. So, now, so now what just, about number know, three being – I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. You said number three? No, because uh, 
Number three is really um, what's called that, that's really fascinating to me. We want African people to save and convert twenty percent of their annual salary each year into a source of revenue outside of employment. Now, one of the things that I learned when I was on my way up, actually, uh, what's called actually um, really investing in my skills and then actually climbing up the economic ladder, is I I I learned from listening to various different success gurus that you, I learned the three percent rule, which is if you devote three percent of your of your income weekly, whatever, into education and training, it's guaranteed to uh, to give you a certain amount of payoff. Is this twenty percent, um, this 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 principle number three and twenty percent of your salary sa- annual salary is that similar to that particular principle? Um, and I think I've heard that one before. This one, the reason I came up with this one, is because. I use the example of a sermon that I heard that T.D. Jakes gave where he talked about creating mm-hmm. local streams of income. And he mm-hmm. recommended that you create four. And he based that on the four rivers coming out of the Garden of Eden. His right. take on it is this. If you reduce to maybe one, maybe two, but mostly if you reduce to one stream of income, now you're forced to you're you're in a you're at the mercy of someone else and you're basically forced to prostitute yourself for the highest mm-hmm. power and you cannot mm-hmm. truly fulfill what your divine mission is because now you've been rendered having to prostitute yourself and your skills for money. So what I had recommended right. was whatever your annual salary is, if you were to convert twenty percent and that's not a hard and fast rule, but it's just kind of a a, a number as a guide. That if you were to use a portion of your annual salary and convert it into a stream of revenue, whether it be in paper assets, whether it be in developing a side business, whether it be in real estate investing, something other than your job should be able to generate revenue for you. And so as you generate a stream of revenue outside of employment, now you don't have to worry if you lose that job. There are other sources of revenue that can support you through a critical moment. Just recently, uh, there's a friend of mine, they had just gotten through a situation where Verizon had gone on strike. And I understand that people mm-hmm. want to make sure that they get their fair share of earnings, but you also put yourself in a position to where you still got to figure out how do I maintain those bills, and if you have a family, how do I keep my family fed? So you never mm-hmm. want to put yourself in a position to where you're at the mercy of somebody else's generosity. And so that's where number three came from. Got you. Got you. Yes. And, and that, that I think is essential. Um, and you know what? Somebody just asked me about that the other day. They were saying to me, because they know that I do low voltage, and they say, the, um, they asked me, did, did, did that like have anything to do with the Verizon strike? And I was like, thankfully not, because I don't know what the hell I would do if I had to deal with that. Um, you know what I'm saying? But so now creating these other streams of revenue, because I just think a lot of people don't know how to do it. Um, <clears throat> I've been asked to do many different things. I've been asked to do multi-level marketing. I've been asked to do, uh, what's it called? Like kind of like the, uh, I don't know what you want to say, like the Avon kind of model where they give you some products and you sell it, you keep a, a, a portion of it. What do you think okay. is the best ways to create these other streams of in, in, income that, uh, doesn't require a whole lot of, I don't know. I, I just, for me, big brother, I'd be very honest with you. I want to have multiple streams of in, income. However, you know, that's one of the reasons why, I, um, that's one of the reasons why I started my own business. But the thing about mm. it is I don't trust a lot of this other stuff that people be doing. And some of it, I just really don't have time for. So what, right. what do you think is one of the best ways to create these other streams of income? Well, one of the ways, and I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head when you were talking about this, um, I think you and I are in that same age bracket where we remember how children used to have lemonade stands. We used to have uh, the paper route. And I remember back in the day when I grew up, we just had a lawnmower in the truck. So it could just be something mm-hmm. that simple to where we could generate enough revenue on that kind of seasonal or side hustle to begin to now save that money and look into another situation where we create another stream of revenue. 
So it's just a matter of starting with something. It doesn't have to be anything big. It doesn't have to be anything innovative. It could just be something that simple as, you know, getting a lawnmower and just start cutting grass during the summer and just sending those proceeds and now starting to look for another stream of revenue that you can get into. Mm-hmm. Huh. Gotcha. And that way, like you were talking about with network marketing, um, I have mixed views of it, and I always find it interesting that in network marketing, they always come amongst our people during a recession. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> without a doubt. And, and like I said, that's a whole other story. And like you said, there have been mixed reviews on network marketing as a business model. In fact, if uh, anyone's been keeping up with the news, right now Donald Trump is in trouble over his Trump University. And it's really not right. because of what the press says. It's because that Donald Trump made the cardinal mistake of trying to create a network marketing business model within Trump University. Now, I have some of the books. And I have some of the home study courses, and it's really good material that that he's put together. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is mm-hmm. that he got into network marketing, and that's when the state attorney general Eric Schneiderman wanted to open up a case on him. Oh, got you. <laughs> Oops. Huh. Yeah. So that was his cardinal mistake. Is you know he got into a market, he got into a business model that I don't think would be food his brand. In fact, I feel network marketing is beneath Donald Trump's brand. If he wanted it to be the kind of brand where it's high end, high value, I don't think network marketing was a smart move on his part. Hmm. Wow, so why do you think he got into it in the first place? Greed. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> I mean bottom line, greed greed and arrogance because you you hear about people who have really made money in network marketing. Um, the two guys who created the Amway, uh, other people who have used network marketing to build fortune. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think what it is is that he didn't have wise people around him, and nor did he make his fortune in network marketing. He made it in real estate development. So – it's right. kind of like he got into something that he didn't know about, nor did he surround himself with people who knew about it in order to create a model that would serve him. And I think he didn't take the time to say, is this good for my brand? So I just right. think greed and right. arrogance really got into it. Got you. Okay, so let's move on to the next three. Um, this is four, five, and six. Uh, we want African people to create – uh, as we want African people to create a sites account for themselves and their families, and sites mm-hmm. is an acronym for savings, investments, tithing, education, and startup capital. Uh, mm-hmm. Five is we want African people to patronize black business businesses with five to twenty five percent of their income, which I'm definitely a fan of. And six, we want African people to invest fifteen to twenty hours per week researching various wealth creating or wealth building opportunities. Now, for me, I try to spend fifteen to twenty hours at least on my particular field, which is electronic security. And that mm. definitely paid off for me because, you know, they, they say um, the average amount of time you should study your field is one hour a day. 15 mm. hours is pretty much double that because it gets you like 14 hours. And if you can spend two hours a day studying your field, you really become an aficionado. Um, it, it sounds like it's a cliche, but I know that, you know, on the various different um, places that I've worked for various different people, I go in there talking about stuff that they have never heard about. And to me, it's everyday stuff. And they're like, uh, I have never heard of that before. That's what you're supposed to do. Like, for instance, on fire rated doors, you're supposed to put fire rated hardware. And they're mm. putting regular hardware on fire rated doors. And we're having this discussion. I'm like, you fools have been doing this for 15, 20 years, and you don't know you're supposed to put fire rated hardware on fire rated doors? And like, oh, isn't it all fire rated? I'm just looking at the ground like, what the hell is going on here? And and most people do not really invest in themselves, much less anything else. So, you know, come on, bring us, take us to the top or the bottom, whichever way you want to attack it. But for me, that's what that means for me. Um, and I'll, I'll just start there since you brought that up. Um, what What you just witnessed is that people do not, invest time in maintaining themselves to be relevant because they're operating on an old paradigm. And with you coming into the picture, 
as someone new in the market, you have the advantage because you don't have to unlearn old ways, old technology. You're coming in right at real time and being able to create a niche in that market. Huh. Got you. Okay, so you're, you're already at an advantage. And, and the same thing about uh, our peoples on the African continent. So let's say, for example, everybody's on you, whether it be fiber optics or whether it be, um, you know, cell phone technology. They don't have to mm-hmm. worry about dealing with an old infrastructure landline base. They can just get in right where the technology is and move forward. Yes. So they have that advantage yes. that many in – Western nations who still have this old infrastructure uh, still have mm-hmm. to unlearn and relearn. Right, right. Man, brother, that, that's a good point. Not only unlearn, but, when, you know, people who have used the copper and pipe lines and things like that, you literally have to rip some of that stuff out. And in nations that never had it, they don't have to deal with that. They can start, yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. And, and so by... And like I said, you're probably sitting there scratching your head in frustration, but at the same time, you're probably blessed because you don't have that burden of having to unlearn old technology. Right, right. Yes, sir. So, gotcha. so you're you're really ahead of the game. And then, like I said, as you present uh, your products and services to the market, now you're presenting it in a real-time manner. And as you invest in keeping up with where the trend is and where the trend is going, people will flock to you because now they see someone who is new, who is innovative, but will also lead them in the right direction. Mm, got you. Got you. Okay. So that's that one. Um, to go back to the one about patronizing black businesses with five to 25% of their income, I think people really need to go back to what the Honorable Marcus Darby talked about in terms of buying black. And not only buying mm-hmm. black, but supporting black. You know, we always talk about supporting black businesses. Now, there have been misconduct on both sides of the equation by the black customer as well as the black business owner. Okay. So right. what right. really what really needs to happen is that we must put our best foot forward, the business owner to the customer and vice versa. So me right. being right. a black customer me being a black customer. If I see, if I come into an establishment, if you have what I need and I know I can get what I need by coming here as opposed to going to a big box retailer, say a Barnes & Noble, I know that a black bookstore will carry things that I cannot necessarily get from a Barnes & Noble, a Books A Million, or even an Amazon. And so I want to be able to support the brother or sister as much as I can. And in doing that, I may not know this, but my continued support of that black-owned business may keep him in business for another week. It may help him make rent for the month. It may help him make payroll that following week. It may help him even to employ one other person. Right, right, right. So, So we don't know how powerful the economic support of black businesses is because it can help that black entrepreneur do better things to give us better service. So it's a, it's a, uh, a mutual benefit for both of us to support right. one another as much as we can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Brother. And then to go to Absolutely. what I call the sites account. Now this can be done as something as simple as getting five big pretzel jars, you know, the pretzel jars you get when you go and, and buy those pretzels. You can empty them Mm -hmm. out, get five jars, and this is something that you can teach to your children as well. So Mm -hmm. we have five, let's say we have five jars, okay? We've got savings, investment, tithing, education, startup capital. The first jar I'll start with is savings. Everybody says you should always save. Uh, In the book, The Richest Man in Babylon, it states that portion of all you earn is yours to keep. Right. right, And that you should also save. Now, uh, to take it from a little metaphysical perspective, <laughs> excuse me, when we say save, like right now it's raining outside. Everybody says save for a rainy day. I said no, because if you save for a rainy day, then that's all it's going to be for is a rainy day. And then when that rainy day comes, now all of a sudden that 
you know, that money is gone for that rainy day and you start all over again. I say mm-hmm. you save for an opportunity. Right, 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 right. Because when you save for an opportunity, now multiple doors will open to you. Uh-huh. Because huh. now you're you're saving for a purpose, and it's a positive purpose. You're saving for an opportunity as opposed to saving for right. a rainy day. So when you save, make sure you save for an opportunity. Right, brother. Um, uh, right. The second I, I one, I, investing, class. is... This is where your money has to go to work for you. Everybody wants to talk about hustling and grinding for their the roles reverse. Huh. Because the paper has to hustle harder than you. Right. You know, right. I, I take mm-hmm. the Ebonics approach to where, you know, do you want to pimp a dollar or do you want to continue to be a holder one? Right, right. I remember you saying that. <laughs> yes, you know, it, it's it's kind of like, uh, somebody put it this way. They said, money is a great servant, but it's a brutal taskmaster. Mm-hmm. This is true. You know, so so we have to make sure that we start making our money work for us. And, and like I said in the, um, in the workshop yesterday, when we look at titans like John D. Rockefeller and Henry Ford and uh, Andrew Carnegie, why is it that even though they're no longer with us, their money is still dictating policy throughout the planet to this day. Mm -hmm. So even in quote unquote death, you know, they're still dictating economic policy and other policies throughout the planet. So that's, to me, that's a, that's the power of true investing. Uh, The third one is tithing. Now, anyone who goes to a church or a masjid or a synagogue or whatever is always saying, you know, you always want to give. Uh, you're not really giving, but you're giving back to the creator or you're giving back to the universe. As a, I call it a gratitude piece because you're showing gratitude for the things that the universe has given you. So you're giving a portion of it back. Now, metaphorically, right. I, I look at it this way. The old adage of nature abhors a vacuum. So when you give, you're basically triggering something that compels the universe to fulfill its promise by filling that void because nature abhors a vacuum. So as you give, you create an opportunity for things to be given back to you to fill that void. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's the third one. The fourth one is what I call education. Now, I'm not talking education in the traditional sense. I'm talking education in terms of Two things, financial literacy uh-huh. and personal development. I think this is what you were getting with with that 3% that you were talking about. Right. When you, when you talk about education, that's where you begin to invest in yourself. So when we talk about financial literacy, I heard, and I, I, I know who it is now, uh, the preacher named Mike Murdoch, and I heard him say something that I thought was very – Interesting. He says, for each year of your life, there should be a book in your home that deals with personal finance, that deals with investing, business, entrepreneurship, or whatever. So right now I'm 45. I'll be 46 in August. So if I'm 45 years old, there should be at least 45 books dealing with money, finance, and business in my library. Wow. Okay. Okay. Wow. And it's just little things like that, that as subtle as it is, it can make a huge difference. And like you said, investing in yourself and your skill sets and ultimately in your business. So just think, if I'm 45 years old, and I know I've got more than 45 books that deal with that, so I'm, I was already ahead of that curve. I thought that was a very powerful piece of advice that Reverend Murdoch gave to his congregation about uh, – about investing in yourself. Like he says, he's got a, I think he has a Kindle or a Nook where he's got programmed over 500 books in it. And as he travels from city to city, when he gives sermons, in between, he's on the plane reading his Kindle. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. So he is constantly reinvesting in himself, even as a minister. And I thought that was a very uh, wise piece of advice that Reverend Murdoch gave about, you know, for each year of your life, you should have a book dealing with those particular subjects. So that's the importance of education and personal development. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Les Brown, 
legendary motivational speaker, he talked about how he invested $7,500 in himself. His career earnings, based on that initial investment, I think his career earnings have been close to $65 million. And when I did the math, for every dollar he put into himself, his return on investment was approximately anywhere from twelve to thirteen, maybe fourteen hundred dollars. No doubt. Okay, and Warren Buffett can't get you that on Wall Street. Huh. So, no doubt. And <laughs> right. And, and then the last, the last jar is S is startup capital. Because of internet and technology, you can launch a business for well under. Ten thousand dollars. I gave the example yesterday in the, in the workshop. Apple got started with just fifteen hundred dollars. John Johnson, the founder of Johnson Publishing Company, which gives you Ebony and gives you Jet, he actually started with a loan from his mother. I think she actually uh, pawned her couch or sold her couch with five hundred dollars. Hmm. And something real funny, Reverend Ike, he was talking about when he started his ministry back in 1959. He only started with $200. Now, guess where he got the seed capital to launch his ministry? Where? Unemployment checks. Oh. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, so he basically started with $200 for his unemployment checks and launched his ministry in 1959. When he was just a, um, you know, poor country boy coming out of originally South Carolina, he makes his way up to New York City, and by by taking those pennies from his checks and was able to launch his ministry. So hmm. it doesn't matter where you start. It's just a matter of, as Booker T. Washington says, drop your bucket where you are and get moving. Right, right, yeah. So, no, so that's that's the whole thing about creating sites and caps. And like I said, this is something that you can actually use as a as a learning tool to teach your children about money. You know, it doesn't require anything sure. fancy. Uh, if you're just tuning in, brothers and sisters, or you've been here for a while and wondering who I'm talking to, I'm talking to my good brother Chris Johnson, and we're dealing with astronomics. He's dealing with principles, uh, 20 principles that he has to give black people financial literacy, independence, and confidence. Um, I believe that we were at number six, so let's do seven, eight, and nine. Um, okay. We want African people to develop a monthly household budget and personal financial statement for each person in the household. In parentheses, it says know your money. Number eight is we want African people to practice economic synergy in their business life. Number nine, we want African people to study and apply the economic philosophies of our black titans to their business and financial lives. The one that's least obvious here is we want African people to practice economic synergy in their business life. Can you please tell the people, start from there, tell them what that is, and then work your way to the other two? Okay. Economic synergy is the way I describe it. Now, Dr. Claude Anderson refers to it as vertical integration, but we are both coming to the same conclusion. Economic synergy is this. Whenever I walk into any ethnic community, the businesses within that community should complement with each other and not compete with each other for the same dollar. And I give this right. example. Let's say um, I come to Albany, mm -hmm. and I see a lot of people who are doing barber shops and hair care salons, things of that nature. Now, I've got one or two choices. Right. Either I can compete with them for the same dollar, for the same amount of heads, or I can develop a warehouse distribution system where I mm -hmm. turn the competitor into a client. Right. 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 Okay. And then on top of that, let's say in order for me to get it from the warehouse to wherever the brother or the sister is set up, I need transportation. So either I can create a transportation or I can find someone who already has a trucking company could be a brother or sister who has, they could be an independent contractor where I ask brothers and sisters who own their trucks, hey, can you uh, move these products to here, there, and everywhere? So based on choosing to complement an industry now, I can create a domino effect to create other industries to support an industry that already exists. So that's what I mean right. by economic yeah. tendency. Right. So instead of stepping on each other's toes, we're basically working together 
so that um, nobody is in front of each other or behind, but we're actually just all yelling seamlessly. Mm -hmm. And and for those of you metaphysically, you can look at this as another form of alchemy to where we're basically creating opportunities out of thin air. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. okay. So that's that's really what I get into with the whole thing of economic synergy. Uh, the one thing when I talk about developing a monthly household budget and personal financial statement, what, the reason I say that is because we all need to, as they say, get our house in order. But now how do we mm -hmm. do that? For those of us, I know most everyone has some type of laptop or desktop computer. And if you look in your Microsoft Office package, and I haven't seen the latest one yet, or even in your, for those who use Apple Macintosh, there should be something in there to where you have a template to where there's a monthly household budget. It's almost like a, a cash flow statement for your, for your household, as well as developing a personal financial statement. And you should mm -hmm. be able to plug in the numbers in your revenue and in your expenses to find out exactly how your money is flowing. You know, I have a saying that I, that I use. I said, if cash is king, cash flow is God. Mm. And the reason I say that is because something Robert Kiyosaki I was talking about, he says when you look at the numbers within a statement, it tells a story. So when I look at your household budget, when I plug in how many streams of revenue are going in versus what's going out, that tells me a story of if there's leakage, within your uh, household plan, if there's leakage within your personal financial statement. And the one thing that I, that I should correct myself, and I'll probably do this, is you don't want to just create a budget, but you also want to develop a financial plan. Okay? Right. And the budget right. is really just the beginning of that. You want to develop a, a financial plan for your long-term financial goals. So I, I just noticed that. But that's the one thing we talk about when we say know your money by developing a monthly household budget and a personal financial statement for each person in the house. And another reason why you should do that is because if you ever have to go for a loan, be it a personal or a business or whatever, when you submit your own personal financial statement, and this is what a banker told me, you actually mm -hmm. increase your chances of getting that loan because now it, it says that you – are serious about your financial life and that you have taken the time to make sure that your numbers are in order as opposed to them giving you a financial statement to fill out. If you come with your own, you increase your chances of getting that loan. Right, right, man. That's very good. Then, I remember hearing yeah, that yesterday. Yeah, I want to get to the, the one about the Black Titans and the philosophies. Yes. <laughs> every, single, every single Black Titan, and I'm also going to include uh, the Honorable Mark Starby and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, where they have given us basic economic philosophies about our business and our financial lives. In fact, you can get uh, Marcus Garvey's Course of African Philosophy, where it teaches you about money, how to save your money, and how to apply it towards certain things, the same way that the messenger has done. Uh, there's one, there's a 10-point rule that A.G. Gaston has, and I think you can Google it and find it. And in fact, it's also in his it's in a book that was written by, I think, his great-niece or great-great-niece. It's called Black Titan. And he uh -huh. has it in there called A.G. Gaston's Rules for Success. Huh. Huh. And it's basic, simple, 10 points. Um, one of the things that he says in there, and I'm paraphrasing it, he says, when you, when you have shown that you can keep money and you know how to master money, now people will come to you with opportunities for loans and other sources of income. It's when you need it the most that you can't get it. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Because you have to show that you have been a good steward of the resources that you already have. That's what banks don't mm -hmm. tell you. Huh. Okay. You know, so, well, you know, they always talk about stewardship in church, but the stewardship never goes into handling the financial resources. Oh, if there's any statement you made today, that was the most heaviest is that you know, the time you need it the most, you can't get it. But when you don't need it, then you could have it. You know, it, it's a, it's abundant. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's, 
let, let's move on to the next three. Uh, okay. okay, so we want – I'm sorry, would you, would you not finish? No, 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 we're good. Go ahead. Okay, okay, so we want African people to teach their children to become producers through entrepreneurial ventures. We want African people to create susus in their homes and communities. And 12, we want African people to become the number one employer of African people. And again, the middle one is the one that I would like to highlight because I just learned about that yesterday. Um, I think a lot of people don't know what a susu is, so you might probably would want to explain that. Um, I know that when they were talking about it yesterday, as a matter of fact, Brother Poetic Vision spoke about it. And then you spoke to another sister who happened to either be the, from the Caribbean or the continent itself. And she had some wonderful uh, uh, anecdote about how she was involved in one where they passed around a certain amount of money. And then one person got the bulk of the money a week. And right. and that was to me that that was a fantastic idea. So please hit our listeners with that particular knowledge because that's something that you can practice right away. Right now, one of the things everybody was trying to figure out how is it that immigrant groups who come to America can get ahead further than those who may be born and raised here in the states. And one of those concepts is a susu. Susu is a, I think the word itself originates out of the Yoruba people in Nigeria. But mm-hmm. susu basically means, if I'm correct with this, it basically means group the group, okay? And right. what they've done is is that the the term go it goes by different terms in different languages. But I'll give you an example of what a susu can be. Let's say that you and I create something called the Ujama Investment Group, okay? And I think mm-hmm. you may have given this uh, example yesterday. So let's say that you and I and maybe three other brothers who are in this group are all entrepreneurs, and we mm-hmm. decide that we need to bankroll one another's ventures, but we don't have the money. So let's say the first month that we form, each one of us puts a thousand dollars in the pot along with the business business plan. We already have a board of wise counsel made up of retired entrepreneurs and business executives. Right. That $5,000 goes with them along with the five business plans. They review it. And then based mm-hmm. on their analysis, they choose the best business plan to receive that initial $5,000, and they give it to that right. individual. Now, the caveat is, is that they have to agree to do business with the other brothers and sisters in the room who are part of that mastermind <clears throat> group. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. And then the next month, we repeat that same cycle, $5,000. It gets reviewed until everybody has received $5,000. Now, we've gone through five months, $5,000. Everyone agrees to support one another, and you don't have to go into debt to do it. Right, right. Okay? And okay. on top of that, you're also practicing two other things. You're also practicing trust. Mm-hmm. And you're also practicing something that I call cultural cohesiveness. And it's something I right. get into a little later in the African Outreach program where I say that there is a direct correlation of a people's cultural cohesiveness and its economic prosperity. There's a direct correlation with it, mm-hmm. an obvious direct correlation with that. And I think that's a lesson that as a people we really need to reevaluate and we really need to drive home is that what is the role of culture in a people's economic prosperity? So that's why, I mean, when we get into about uh, developing susus. Now, the the, I want to go back to number 10 where it says we want African people to teach their children to become producers through entrepreneurial ventures. It goes back earlier uh, near the top of the conversation where we talk about how we need to get children back into that lemonade stand and that newspaper delivery mode mentality. I'm not a fan Mm -hmm. of giving children an allowance for this reason is that I do not want to, as I took a quote from the messenger, put the seed of dependency in them as babies. I want them to have an independent spirit. Now, did you watch the Damon Dash uh, interview on The Breakfast Club? I most certainly did, yes, sir. (laughs) Okay, so you remember when he's talking about how, I think he said his 13-year-old son is now selling his own cookies. Because Mm -hmm. when he saw his dad out here hustling, uh, putting money back into the street, and going into all these entrepreneurial ventures, because his son saw that, 
he decided right. to get into his own entrepreneurial venture. Uh, there's another sister who calls herself the dynamic diva, Elon Bomani. She's originally out of Philly. And she mm-hmm. said that because her two sons saw mommy write books, he says, I want to write a book. And not only did he write a book, he created a little film called I Can Be Barack Obama. The young brother is seven years old when he did it. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Damn. So as adults, if we're serious about creating self-reliant, self-sufficient children, then we need to show and prove so they can follow the leader. Right. Okay. And the other one where we get into, we want African people to become the number one employer of African people. Uh, I give credit to Dr. George C. Frazier, uh, who's our uh, networking elder, uh, who wrote the book Success Runs in Our Race. He said that would probably take 100 years to make happen, but we need to plant the seed to where we have to be the number one employer of our own people. And the reason I say that is this. There's a direct correlation between the lack of black businesses and the disproportionate representation of us in the prison system. Huh. And, and I'll tell you why. Because when you see that the, the prison system is predominantly African and Latino, but you rarely see Asians in there. And then when I look at the business ventures within a lot of Asian communities, be it Chinese, Vietnamese, Cambodian, or Japanese, it's like the men, I've never seen an Asian man to this day have to go on welfare. Right. (laughs) Okay. Because there's always something for the men to do within their communities, whether it's working in restaurants, construction firms. So there's something that Asian men can do. So the more that Asian men are employed and self-employed, the less that you will see them in the prison system. Now, sure, everybody has their own version of organized crime, but even within organized crime, there's always something for them to do. So you don't see them in Mm -hmm. jail the way you see us disproportionately represented in jail. Right. Okay. So, excuse me. So that's what I mean when we have to become the number one of employer, and, and this will probably go into something later, in order for us to do that, we have to begin building businesses of size and scale to where we can put brothers and sisters on payroll and be able to pay them living wages, not just minimum wages. Right. Okay. Yep. So that's yeah. So that's what I mean by becoming the number one employer of African people. Right. Right. See, now that's the thing that that's one of the biggest debates that's being had amongst those who are in inside and outside the conscious and nationalist community some of those who have made it a little bit bigger than others is the living wage debate. People talk about living wage and um, what's it called versus minimum wage. And my good brother, Mr. Holicism, he educated me on that because I, I, I kind of confused the two. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, minimum wage, minimum wage. But in reality, we really need to focus on the living wage because you can't live off a minimum wage. And it's, it's kind of inhumane anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and the one thing about that debate, oh, everybody wants to talk about having a minimum wage. Like right now, everybody's excited about this, quote, unquote, new minimum wage is supposed to come up uh, $15 an hour. But what people aren't peeping is this. There's two enemies that you got to deal with when you're trying to fight to push the minimum wage up to a higher level, inflation and taxes. So now inflation and taxes – either way or ultimately destroy the purchasing power of that new minimum wage. And that's what people aren't really looking at. So, okay, fine. New York state just got into $9 an hour, but now what has taxes and inflation done to the purchasing power of that $9 an hour minimum wage? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh. And just, yeah. And just recently you, you're probably noticing this as well as I, and I knew it was going to happen now this summer. In Arizona, you're going to see the first fully automated robotic McDonald's. Huh. You see, this, this is what I've been talking about. Huh? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, okay, I'll okay. let you talk yeah. now. 
So, so I knew they were going to come with that because now what you're trying to do, and this is the one thing that people have to understand about corporations. They have one legal obligation is to fulfill the fiduciary obligation to their shareholders. That's the only legal uh-huh. obligation that they have, to fulfill the fiduciary obligation to its shareholders. Huh. And so when they came with that, some may think it's mean, but they're just following the legal advice saying, how do you maximize profits for your shareholders? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. So yep. as, as, you know, as Michael Corleone says, it ain't personal. It's business. It's business. Strictly business. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, we, we definitely on the same page. That was exactly what I was thinking. See, and, and, and one of the, I think one of the shows I sent you, this is what I've been screaming for, brother, in the last couple of shows. I've been trying to tell people, you cannot be that guy that goes to work every day, punches the clock, comes home, drinks a beer, and watches the basketball game. Like, you got to really invest in your skills and your own and, and personal capital because this robot revolution is coming. It's not only going to be wiping out fast food jobs and things like that. They're talking about driverless cars in the trucking industry. I mean, that would be devastating because you and I both know, especially in the South, that a huge part of the black community's economy is brothers drive those trucks. So if they were able to successfully put driverless trucks on the road, hundreds and thousands of black men and, and, and some black women also would be out of work. They were saying that the pharmacy industry, that they would be uh, able to basically automate the pharmacy industry, paralegal work where you look up um, certain uh, what's called files and certain statutes and things like that. They're trying to um, come up with software to basically get rid of that particular – it's just so many things that they're trying to get rid of with the robot industry and make things a lot more – what's called uh, a lot more cost effective. So when you said that yesterday, I mean, you know, it was your class, so I didn't raise my hand, but I've been talking mm-hmm. about that in the last couple of shows. And it's definitely what you're saying is on point. Right. And in fact, I gave a, for your audience, if they want to go further into that subject, there's a book I highly recommend. It's called The End of Work by Jeremy Rifkin. Mm-hmm. And there's a chapter in there. It's called Chapter Five. It's chapter Five. It's called Technology and the African American Experience. He actually had lunch one day with Dr. Claude Anderson, and he says, "Dr. Anderson, I had to fight with the publisher to keep that chapter in the book." Right, 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 right. I remember you saying that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And the reason being is because that chapter basically showed how we were rendered obsolete. So in the South, when they started coming with uh, the technology for automated cotton picking machines, cotton gin, and everything else, our labor in the mm-hmm. South was rendered obsolete by the end of World War II. Right, <clears throat> right. And then in the North, when we get into the whole factories, we're in robotics, like you were talking about robotics coming into the, the car manufacturers and everything else, right at the end tail of the black power movement, I say by 1973, our mm-hmm. labor was rendered obsolete. So now you've got close to anywhere between 40 to 60 million people of African origin whose labor you don't need. Now, what do you do with them? Uh, yep. <clears throat> Good question. And that's see, this is what people saying. don't understand. So that's why I tell African people, you out here picketing for a higher minimum wage, you don't understand. You've been rendered obsolete for over 30 years. Uh-huh. Huh. Uh-huh. Huh. So... So I think African people need to understand that you've already been tossed overboard because now, from an economic perspective, perspective you've been considered dead weight. Right. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so that is. Yeah. So we. Yeah. So we covered those. We can go ahead and go on to the next three. Okay. So the next three being what is uh we want to ask number people. thirteen. Okay. We want African people to engage heavily in the manufacturing and distribution section of business. Fourteen mm-hmm. is we want African people to focus on building businesses that can generate a minimum of $1 million to $10 million in an- annual revenue. Fifteen mm-hmm. is we want African people to invest 15 to 20 hours a week in boosting their financial IQ and financial intelligence. I want to okay. focus on uh, – and for some reason, it always turns out it's the middle one I want to focus on first. But <laughs> I, uh, Okay. 
building business oh. that generate a minimum of $1 million in annual revenue. Now, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, black people will say, that's not possible. You got to stand, uh, start out small and blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, a lot of us have self-limiting beliefs. Please talk about, because I, I know one of the things when I first started talking to you that I really got excited about is you talked about getting black people to build businesses to size and scale. Can you please address that one first? Okay. And I think this kind of goes back to looking at the messengers. I think I had a three-year economic blueprint. One of the things that I feel that he wanted to stress was if you're going to build a nation, okay, and people have to really have the kind of vision and the foresight. You're talking about building a nation, mm-hmm. and that you're going to need industries of size and scale to where you can begin to put your people to work. Now, also, we have some very bright, talented college students in various forms, agriculture, engineering, economics, um, animal husbandry, agribusiness, okay? We have those type of bright students, but the problem is when they want to come home, we don't have the infrastructure to put them to work because they've got student loans to pay, and so we lose them to Fortune 500 companies. We lose them to the uh-huh. government sector, be it local, county, state, federal, because they've got to pay these loans back. So now what's happened is because we didn't build the necessary infrastructure, we lose two things. We not only lose the human resource, we also lose the financial resource because we didn't yep. build a net big enough to catch our own fish. Right. Okay. And the, the whole yep. thing is I'm not knocking mom and pop enterprises, but these mom and pop enterprises have got to start evolving and they've got to start uh, transcending that level to put our people to work because we can no longer afford to lose our best and brightest to building somebody else's empire. Hmm, got you. Okay. And just like I was saying with you as one, as a business coach, my whole thing is I'm always asking people to think of how can I build a million-dollar enterprise because I'm sure being under the tutelage of uh, the messenger's work and, and Mr. Farcon's work, you want to be able to put your people to work and give them a living wage so that way they can take care of their families without stress and strife. Hmm. Without okay. a doubt, and so, you know something, brother. Let me let me just say this to you um, before you go any further. Um, one of the things, like my dad, he never wanted to have employees. And my dad, you know what I'm saying, is, is a monster in, in this particular field. Like my dad is is the person that have advised me and guided me all the way through it, from the physical to the electronic, and now you know to be a business owner, which is what he'd been trying to push me towards for God knows when. But the reality mm-hmm. of it is, is that. You know, my dad never wanted to have employees because he was like, I don't really want to deal with other people's attitudes and ideas and things like that. Me, my goal always was to have employees. And one of the reasons why I knew I wanted to have employees is because I know I'm not going to reach the multi-million dollar level I really want to unless I do, number one. And number two, being a Muslim, being a father of Elijah Muhammad, being a person that knocked on so many doors and did so much soldiering when I was younger, I saw so much poverty and want, and so many people that were out of work, but I seen some people who I knew if they had meaningful stuff to do, that they wouldn't be so poor. I always wanted to be able to give that to somebody else. And so when you talked about having, you know, a business of size and scale, to me, that that kind of resonated with me because that's kind of, you know what I'm saying? Like me, I want to continue the tradition. I want to be also be able to pass it down to my son. But another more important thing about it for me is to be able to actually give you know, to say that you gave four or five hundred black men and women a job in your particular company and gave them the ability to actually make some serious decent money. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, your father may also, and neither one of you is wrong because both of you have legitimate needs. Now, your father may see, have seen something that I talk about is that as I look at how the economy is shifting in America, it's really heading back to what it was before the Industrial Revolution, being a predominantly self-employed nation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And by by seeing that kind of mode, you know, going back to what the messenger talked about, that there will come a day when whites cannot employ themselves and we're already here, 
that's where I say the whole self-employed movement amongst African people, and I dare call it an entrepreneurial revolution, uh, is beginning to manifest itself amongst our people. Maybe out of necessity, maybe out of frustration, or maybe because the time is now to do that because uh, we're in the desert, like the children of Israel. And we're mm-hmm. in a process of detoxing ourselves of that slave mentality so we can go and take over our own promised land. Hmm. And and so both hmm. of you both of you have legitimate points and I think both of you will have a place at the round table to be able to help your people in your own way. Hmm. Okay. Gotcha. So <clears throat> so so I think both of you are like I said both of you are on the same track. You're just looking at different ways of getting there. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, and then the next one about engaging heavily in the manufacturing and distribution sections of business, uh, this comes from a book called Zero to One Million uh, by Ryan Allen. <laughs> and in, in the book, he says that all businesses fall under one of four categories. He mentions manufacturing, distribution, retail, and service. Uh, having been in different parts of the country, what I'm noticing is is that we're heavy in that retail service piece where we're getting all the right. upfront cash, but we're not in the manufacturing and in the distribution. Like I give an example to cats who have been in the drug game. Here's mm-hmm. something that's interesting. Have you ever noticed that the people who manufacture and distribute the product never go to jail? Huh. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yes, sir. So when when everybody wants to talk about cats, be it Nikki Barnes, Guy Fisher, um, Frank Lucas, or whomever, at the very best they were retailers, but they were never distributors or manufacturers of the product. Mm, right. Right. Yep. Okay. Yes, so what what that taught me was that it's a manufacturing and the distribution of products that's where the real power and the real money lie. And just to give you this idea, uh, the Medellin cartel out of Colombia, which was run by the old man Ochoa, never did a day of jail in his life. Empire that, and I hope you're sitting down for this, he generated an empire that generated $170 million every 30 days. Damn, brother. Every 30 days, $170 million. So now you're talking about a business annually of well close to $2 billion. Huh. Damn. Because he was in charge of the manufacturing and the distribution of the product. He wasn't just raking up the upfront money. He was controlling and owning the resources that produced it. And this goes into understanding financial IQ. And it's a good segue, financial IQ and financial intelligence. So if you had a money problem, you're thinking about, okay, how can I alleviate this? So let's say you have a debt you want to alleviate. So you can sit here and try to nickel and dime your way to reduce your expenses or live below your means or whatever, or you can figure out a way of how can I generate extra money to put into this. But in many cases, many of us go out and get a second job, and we kill ourselves doing it, or we create oh, an asset yeah, to it. generate new money. Right. And once we alleviate that debt, we still have the asset that can continue to generate money. So it measures about how you look at your money problem, and then how do you solve your money problem? Hmm. So that's what the financial intelligence and the financial IQ that I get at that we have to invest in. And the reason I'm choosing yes. 15 to 20 hours a week, I'm going back and using that 10% philosophy. There's 168 hours in a week, so if we take 10% of our week to focus on that, that's roughly, you know, maybe two hours a day hmm. that yes, we can yes, focus on yep. doing that. So I'm I'm not asking for a whole lot of time, but I am asking this, and I mentioned this yesterday in the piece. Uh, in Dennis Kimbrough's book, The Wealth Choice, he talks about, according to a research, I think it was done by the Pew Research Group, where they said the average black American 
watches an average of 75 to 77 hours of television a week. Right, which is crazy. <laughs> now, now that's, that's roughly 10 to 11 hours of television a day versus the average black millionaire who may watch less than 30. And so when I mentioned the thing about how many people in here watching Empire, I said, do you want to spend an hour a week watching Lucius and Cookie hold on to a fictitious empire, or do you want to invest that kind of time in building your own empire? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I remember that question. <laughs> it was very yeah, quiet. It's a matter of there. value and priority. Let, let me interrupt you for a second. I want to ask you a question. This is something Snell wanted me to ask you. What is the difference between being self-employed and being a business owner? Because many people don't really know the difference and think that the two are the same thing. They think that the two are interchangeable. So can you can you speak to that? When you're self-employed, I'll use examples. Um, let's say those of our professionals, whether they are bookkeepers, accountants, doctors, uh, psychologists, etc., who may have private practices. Basically, when you're self-employed, you own a job is really what it is. If you are a mm-hmm. business owner or an entrepreneur, you have created a business or a company, and you hire people to run it for you. So, for example, if we were to take, uh, let's say you and I, we buy a professional sports franchise, okay? We're co-owners, mm-hmm. but what we do is we go and we hire a general manager. We hire a coach who hires a, a coaching staff. So it's kind of like, do you – we own it, but we hire people to run what we own. Hmm. Got you. Okay. Got you. Got you. Yeah, Got so you. that's really the difference between hmm. being self-employed and being a uh, business owner or entrepreneurial. Hmm. And and the, the, the advantage of being a business owner or an entrepreneur is you begin to generate what I like to call mailbox money or what is called passive or residual income. It's money that right. you ain't got to work for. So let's say you could be in another part of the country, but if you built your business to where it generates money in your sleep, and that's the, that's the mm-hmm. goal that I really want black entrepreneurs to get to is to the point where they're making mailbox money. Right. Wow. Huh. Okay. See, that that's okay. <laughs> We, I, I hope and pray that because uh, I, I uh, shared this uh, show in a lot, a lot, a lot of groups. So I hope and pray that a lot of people listen to this. But I know that I will play it again. Um, I saw some of my B B A I O brothers sharing it. Um, it is definitely fantastic. So let us try to uh, deal with these last couple of points because I think it's going to shut us off at seven thirty. So we were at what we were at. Um, I think I think we were at sixteen, which is uh. Well, we want African people to invest in their primary asset, the human mind. 17 mm-hmm. is we want African people to build wealth before creating a lifestyle. I'm down, yeah. definitely down with that. We want African people to find potential mates who are fiscally responsible and emotionally mature. You got to deal with that one first. <laughs> <laughs> African people find potential mates who are fiscally responsible and emotionally mature. Uh, yeah. Dave Ramsey, who has his own um, – finance show on Fox Business News, and I recommend uh, reading some of his material. Now, he actually became a multimillionaire based on using biblical principles, and I'm noticing that a lot of churches are beginning to use his material. Uh, I think it's called Financial University. In what Dave Ramsey said about in every relationship and every marriage, there's two mentalities that exist. You have a saver and you have a spender. And what you have to do is how do you take those two extremes and put them into one? Now, I had to look back in my own relationships and find out who was I. Was I the saver or was I the spender? I saw that I was the saver in my relationships. Some people may have been the spender in their relationships. So it's almost like how do you bring those two extremes together so that way you can operate as one? Okay. Yes, sir. And also, yeah. And also what you have to understand is when I say uh, fiscally responsible and emotionally mature, you really have to master your emotions in order to master your money. Hmm. Okay, because money is an emotional subject, and that sounds cliche, but it's never more true. Notice how when you got money, you're on top of the world. 
When you ain't got no money, you feel like you ain't got a friend in the world. Without a doubt. Okay. So Without there's something doubt. about money and emotions that, that are interconnected. Huh. Okay. Truth be told. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when you don't have money, it's just like you got cancer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's kind of like you know Kanye West song "Gold Digger," right? You know when when she says, "No, I ain't saying she a gold digger, but she ain't messing with no." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 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 like I said, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's funny, but it ain't no joke. So, right. <laughs> now, the one thing where I talk about wanting to build wealth before creating a lifestyle, um, and mm-hmm. that's why I use the example of whenever we get our tax refunds, what happens? We we start trying to live like Rockefeller. We go down. We buy all types of stuff that brings us no return on our quote unquote investment, and by the you know, by the end of February, in the beginning of March, the money's gone. You know, the money, the money is gone. So how are we being good stewards of the resources that we do have instead of asking for more? Have we mastered uh, the resources that we do have? Are we building wealth to create the lifestyle that we have? Sure. My fantasy vehicle is a Land Rover. But I know I have to build wealth in order to have the lifestyle of a Land Rover. So I don't let, you know, the Land Rover consume me, but I let it serve as kind of an incentive for building wealth. Mm -hmm. You see, like I have a saying. I said, if you own a Land Rover, if you own a Land Cruiser, and you're still paying money to a landlord, you're a fool. Hmm. Okay, Mm, mm, mm. Mm -hmm. because that goes back to what do we own as a people? Hmm. Okay, and then getting into the whole thing about investing in our primary asset, the human mind, and this is what our ancestral scholar Amos Wilson said. He said, the true wealth of a people does not exist in the land they may occupy. It exists in the mind and the human consciousness. That's why when you read that Napoleon Hill classic, think and grow rich. All wealth begins in the mind, but it ends in the wallet. Right. You see? Right, right, and right, there, right. It, yes, right. And there's something that Dennis Kimbrough says. He says, the average person comes up with a multi-million dollar idea four times a year. So that's once every 12 weeks. All you got to do is take one and you ride with it until you become successful. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. So we're always coming up with the ideas. The question is, how many of us take action on those ideas? Huh. Okay. Not many of so us. That's really. what it does. It, it, it takes action. So it's not about being smart. It's about, are you taking action? That's that's really what that is. So investing in the human mind. So when you invest in the human mind, now you're trying to, you know, everybody talks about having, you know, making sure you're conscious and everything else. Okay, now once you become conscious, are you being productive with your consciousness? Mm-hmm. See, that's that's the key. It's one thing to get you to being conscious or being aware. Now how do I graduate you from consciousness to productivity? Huh. You see, huh. and I think that's something uh-huh. that within the the cultural conscious community we've missed. It's not it's not just about being conscious; it's about being productive with your consciousness. Exactly, exactly, brother. You know, huh. so that's and so that's what those are. I think we've got two more that we can go ahead and tap into. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Okay, and that's nineteen and twenty. Oh yeah, we're doing pretty good. Okay. So we want African people, 19 is we want African people to leave an economic legacy for future generations. And Mm -hmm. 20 is we want African people to create a mission, vision, and purpose as part of their financial plan for their lives. Now, when I talk about leaving economic legacy, um, 
I think it's criminal that we sit up here and we make babies, but yet we don't give them tools to take them into that next generation. I think there's something, and you you can probably correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's in the Old Testament where it talks about how a man should prepare his financial life to take care of the next seven to ten generations of his seed? Yes, definitely Old Testament. Definitely. Okay, so when I go back and I look at, you know, someone like a John D. Rockefeller, when I look at a Joe Kennedy, or when I look at some of the other titans uh, that built this country uh, in terms of the 20th century, I'm looking at how their money has taken care of their seeds seven 10, maybe 12 generations deep. You know, what are we as African people, are we building that kind of economic legacy to where we can actually have a, uh, we can transfer resources even while we're alive? You know, are we building something that we can transfer to the next generation? So that way our generation is not starting from zero every 20 to 30 years, which I think is criminal. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. Like I'm pretty sure you as you build your company, you want to build it to where now you can entrust it into the hands of your children, you know, once you want to step down in retirement, you hand the car keys over to your children and now they can run the business. Hmm. Yep. <laughs> yep, cuz I, okay. I I I told you that my son is going to follow in my footsteps and he's going to be 18 next year. And uh, so basically, he's spending his college money to go get his alarm license, just like I have it. And uh, so, because I, I already told him, I said I should be up and running by the time you turn 18. So you know, if you go ahead and invest your money and get an alarm license, then you'll be able to what's it called you you'll be able to uh, you know you'll be able to phase right into the business, and you could be my supervisor. And I saw his wheels turning because it, it's it's becoming real to him the older he gets. Right. And, and this is how, for me, I think this is one of the ways that we can gain or regain the expect the respect of our youth because now we are preparing a place for them at a table that we built, that we're not throwing them out to the wolves and having them defend for ourselves. We can say, hey, come to the round table. Here's a plate that's already here for you. Mm-hmm. Okay, because we always talk about how much we love our children, and it's got to be about the babies, but what are we really doing for the babies? Right. You know, so that's that's one of the things that we really have to get into is that our love for our children has to go beyond lip service. Got you. Okay. Huh. And then the, the final one about creating a mission, vision, and purpose as part of the financial plan for our lives and this is something that you can do as an individual or you can actually do as a couple. In fact, I'm thinking about eventually being able to sit down with couples, whether they're engaged or whether they're newlyweds or whatever, about creating a financial mission, vision, and purpose for their financial lives. So when I talk about having a mission, vision, and purpose, I start with a vision. Who do you aspire to be in terms of your financial life? You, you know, do you aspire mm-hmm. for financial self-sufficiency and, you know, going about that? Now, when I talk about creating a mission statement for your financial life, there's two questions that that statement should be able to ask and answer. Number one, uh, why does my financial life exist or what is the purpose of fi- my financial life? And then what do I intend to achieve or accomplish with that? With the mm-hmm. purpose of my financial life, Why does it exist? And then what is my driving force behind it? Do you want to leave a legacy for your children? Do you want to make sure that your children will not ever want for anything? Um, Do you want to make sure that your wife is is good? Or if she has health challenges, you want to take, you know, so what is your driving force here, you know, in order to do that? And I think once you begin to, to think those things through, and that's why I said it's not enough for you to create a budget. You want to create a financial plan that will look on a short, mid-range, and a long-term basis. Got you. Got you. Got you. Huh. Wow. <clears throat> My brother, I uh, definitely, I mean, listen, I already uh, was supercharged from your uh, uh, presentation yesterday. But this definitely is one of the Hall of Fame shows I've had. Um, 
I'm so glad that Chanel uh, put me in contact with you because you definitely, um, I mean, I don't know what to say because I'm, I'm really, my mind is <laughs> racing in a thousand directions right now, but you definitely are somebody that is a jewel to the black community. And, and I, I, I hope that I've done my part to uh, get your name out there a little bit more. I also want to do some shows with you in the future on some other po uh, topics, but at least the people know what you stand for now and what your principles are stand for, which I'm behind 1,000%. So your principles are my principles and our principles, but I hope and pray that you have the best of success, and I will definitely be talking to you about my own personal security company business. And the law willing, we can get some, some things off the ground for me, you, and everybody else. Uh, thank you. And that's, that's one of the things I've always said. Um, I don't really get caught up in titles per se. I just tell people, they say, well, who are you? All I can do is say that, I, that I'm basically an humble servant of African people. And um, yes, sir. I, I, I take that um, from, you know, whether it's my teacher, uh, Brother Steve Coakley, whether it's the minister who – I know he always says, I'm, I'm your servant and I'm your brother. I know he means that sincerely uh, when right. he says, I'm your servant and I'm your brother. So mm -hmm. I, I come from that in terms of when you serve the people, because I think we forget about what true leadership is, is that the greatest of us ultimately become the servants of those who, who are under our care. And, and when we mm -hmm. serve those in term, I think, it says he who seeks to save his life or preserve it will lose it, but he who mm -hmm. seeks to give it will save it. And so this is me in terms of giving to the people uh, through my skill sets of business, economics, and, and self-help to help our people help themselves and to restore themselves in their rightful place in human history. Got you. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I tried to get Sinella to say something, but she didn't want to say anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> I tried to bring her in. She said, "Nope." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's my sister. I love her so much. I've known her for so oh. long, and uh, <laughs> but okay, my brother. All right then. Uh, what you call it? So that that's going to do it because uh, they, they're going to shut us off in a second anyway. Thank you very much for um, for coming on the radio show. Hope and pray that we could do this again. Um, mm -hmm. You have a blessed day, and I'll be talking to you soon. You take care. Yes, sir. You too. Well, that's going to do it for us, brothers and sisters. Um, as we always say, salam alaikum, hotep, peace, Black African power. <laughs>